a franchise plagued by accusations of occult inspiration, a game that some believe blurred the lines between fantasy and reality that became too real in the minds of the players. Fraught with monsters, demons, spirits, dragons, and wizards, skeletons and goblins, and creaky doors deep within trap-laden labyrinths. So haunted and perilous, so seductive and corruptive that it was a perfect fit for Saturday morning cartoons. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of the Dungeons & Dragons animated series. Dungeons & Dragons was an animated series that ran for 27 episodes from 1983 to 1985. It was created by Kevin Paul Coates and Dennis Marks. Developed for television by Mark Avenier, who would have spent more time on it, but he had to move on to his much more successful show, Garfield & Friends. Mark wrote the pilot episode titled The Night of No Tomorrow, establishing all of the major characters and relationships, but more importantly, he took a previously existing, overly complex initial concept for the series and boiled it down to its essence, something with a simple formula that could be executed by the other writers who would follow him on the series. It was in that distillation of complexity that the general concepts of Dungeons & Dragons, the game, transformed into an easily consumable, relatable, and safe entertainment product. It was good for the brand at large, given the assertions from parents' groups that it was somehow dangerous. Dungeons & Dragons began as a role-playing game in the mid-70s, but became a cultural phenomenon selling hundreds of thousands of copies by 1982. Yes, there were already dice-based war games in existence for decades, but D&D made the move into suburban living rooms with actual televised commercials and rules for kids as young as 10. It was in that appeal to children that some parents began to take issue. A group called Bothered About Dungeons & Dragons was founded by Patricia Pulling after her son committed suicide in 1982. She believed that D&D &D was responsible for his death after he had begun playing the game at school. There was major network coverage of suicides and murders that were alleged to have been related to involvement in the game. Tom Hanks even starred in a film called Mazes and Monsters in 1982, which dramatized the story of James Dallas Egbert, who, it was reported, attempted to kill himself in the tunnels at the university he was attending. Gary Gygax himself went on 60 Minutes opposite Patricia Pulling to defend D&D &D as a positive creative experience that encouraged the use of imagination and problem solving. For more on the history of Dungeons & Dragons The Game, be sure to check out our video The Tragedies and Triumphs in the History of Dungeons & Dragons. TSR, the company that owned Dungeons & Dragons, sought to capitalize on that popularity, that exposure for the brand, even if part of that exposure was driven by the controversies that followed the game at every mention. TSR established TSR Entertainment, which would become D&D &D Entertainment, with the explicit purpose of licensing Dungeons & Dragons to Hollywood productions. TSR, in cooperation with LJN Toys, developed a line of action figures inspired by Advanced Dungeons & Dragons The Game. They varied in size from non-posable plastic miniature figurines to fully articulated 5- and 6-inch figures and even a full-size Fortress of Fangs interactive playset. The figures produced under license by LJN represented some of the main character classes, some key player characters, and a whole slew of monsters to be used in conjunction with campaign modules specifically designed for those action figures. The designs drew their inspiration from the original artwork featured in the D&D guides and character descriptions. The action figure line was a more traditional play-oriented approach to the fantasy combat that was a major part of the game. In the eerie world of deep, dark dungeons, mystery and magic seem real. There's good against evil with advanced Dungeons & Dragons action figures. War Duke, Kellogg, Strongheart, and Bronze Dragon, each sold separately. Beware, Strongheart. You'll cast an evil spell and steal the treasure. Yeah. Evil is no match for good. The treasure is safe. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons action figures. Kellogg, War Duke, Bronze Dragon, Strongheart, each sold separately from LJN. Meanwhile, Marvel Productions picked up the Dungeons & Dragons license from D&D Entertainment to begin development of an animated series, but revision after revision resulted in an overly complicated mess that was in dire need of focusing from a fresh perspective. Under significant time constraints, pressured to get a fully realized concept that could be sold to a network, Marvel Productions gave everything they had to Mark Evanier. In Mark's own words, quote, In the development process, as the format is being worked out and characters are added, deleted, or defined, you often get lost in the 93rd revision. The CBS folks felt that Dungeons & Dragons was 
almost there as a series, but that it needed some work from a fresh mind. I have an extremely fresh mind to go with my fresh mouth." End quote. Dungeons & Dragons was different from the normal expected process for the development of a cartoon. Usually, the toy line is the first thing that is developed, and the show and all the supporting media follow with the goal of selling the toy line. In this case, the main product, the game, was already established. The figure line followed again as a means to support the game. The animated series came in at the end to support the toy line and the game to broaden the audience and recognition of the brand, which all leads back to the game. Dungeons & Dragons the Animated Series followed the adventures of six friends who thought they were taking an innocent trip on the Dungeons & Dragons ride at the carnival. Halfway through the tunnel, they are magically transported, lion, witch, and wardrobe style, to the world of Dungeons & Dragons, where they will spend the rest of their lives trying to find a way home. See, it's funny, because if they had just listened to the concerned parent groups about the dangers of all things D&D, they never would have ended up in this mess in the first place. Upon arrival in D&D land, they are greeted by Tiamat, the five-headed dragon, Uni the unicorn, and their host and guide, Dungeon Master. Each of the six friends are given a character class and a signature weapon. Hank becomes a ranger with a magical bow, Eric a cavalier with a magic shield, Diana the acrobat with a magic staff. Albert becomes Presto the wizard with a magic hat, Sheila a thief with a cloak of invisibility, and Bobby, her younger brother, is a barbarian with a magical club. They are tasked by Dungeon Master with not only finding their way home, but also fighting against the evil Venger and the dark forces at his command. And all of that setup is masterfully done within the opening theme for the show. The star-studded voice cast included Willie Ames and Adam Rich, both formerly of the comedy drama Eight is Enough, Don Most, who starred as Ralph Malf on Happy Days, and they were supported by animation stalwarts like Peter Optimus Prime Cullen and Frank Megatron Welker, a sentence that types itself whenever we cover an 80s animated series. Dungeons & Dragons had arrived and had broken through the attempts to prevent it from reaching the hearts and minds of children the world over. Its tentacles of corruption were now in every aspect of daily lives. This is tentacles, right? <laughs> These are talons, not tentacles. <laughs> Dungeons & Dragons board games, Dungeons & Dragons Halloween costumes, Dungeons & Dragons stickers, coloring books, color forms, storybooks, look, even if Dungeons & Dragons was a conduit of all the evils of Satanism and the black magics of hell itself up until this moment, that spell was broken the day Dungeons & Dragons became shrinky dinks. Evil is strong, but it cannot survive both shrinking and dinking. For all the cross-promotion, for all the licensing, for all the supporting products that made it to the shelves, very little of it featured the characters from the cartoon itself. Characters from the game and the action figure line featured prominently. No one would blame you for assuming that Strongheart was the main hero in the cartoon battling against his arch-nemesis, Warduke. That's the visual story that plays out on the rest of the merchandising. But LJN never produced figures for the characters that were unique to the cartoon. No Venger, no Dungeon Master, no Hank, Eric, Sheila, Bobby, or Uni. No magical roller coaster that features our realm on one side and the realm of Dungeons and Dragons on the other. Strongheart, Warduke, and a few of the other toy and game related characters made cameo appearances on the show, but that's it for crossover. Some merchandise, including a series of small, non posable PVC figures, were released in Spain, but they are exceedingly rare and command a hefty price in good condition on the secondary market today. The most likely reason why LJN never produced action figures based on the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon is the most obvious one they couldn't, they didn't have the rights to the characters. LJN's line of advanced Dungeons & Dragons figures were released in the beginning of 1983, as were a lot of D&D-related products. The D&D cartoon began airing in late 1983. Any licensing agreements created prior to Marvel and TSR co-producing the D&D cartoon would not have included any elements from it. It was possible to write Strongheart and Warduke into a few episodes of the cartoon, which they did. It was not possible to retroactively include the cartoon characters in any of the licensing agreements. And not for nothing, but the cartoon was already pushing the envelope with respect to the content directed at young children. Michael Reeves, writer of seven episodes, has explained that the production crew, quote, took the show about as far as you could go on kids' TV at the time. As an example, the script for The Dragon's Graveyard, in which the kids contemplate killing Venger in order to find a way home, caused a battle royale with broadcast standards and practices, end quote. 
And while parents groups still represented a very small minority of the parenting audience, they were also a very noisy minority. The previously mentioned Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons teamed up with the National Coalition on Television Violence to ask the Federal Trade Commission and Federal Communications Commission for regulations warning consumers of the possible violent effects of the game and the Saturday morning cartoon. Despite all that, Dungeons & Dragons led its time slot for two years. It's rare that any show can get more than one season. D&D did just that and without the support of an action figure line that needed constant refreshing of characters. After 27 episodes over the course of three years, ratings, predictably, began to decline. It was canceled without the kids ever returning home from the realm of Dungeons & Dragons. There was no final episode depicting the kids' return home, but Marvel Productions did hire Michael Reeves to write a final script. Michael wrote seven of the 27 episodes, so he's just as much an authority as anyone involved in the production, so if you want to consider it canon, you have a pretty strong case to do so. While it has never been animated, Michael himself made the script available online, and there are several fan-produced audio recordings, one of which features Katie Lee reprising her role as Sheila. A simple search on YouTube will give you the closure you've been looking for all these decades later. Since 1985, the franchise has been mostly dormant. In 1996, TSR published a limited series of promotional comics. The Forgotten Realms issue, The Grand Tour, features a cameo by the characters from the cartoon still living in the world of Dungeons & Dragons as adults. TSR and all D&D-related products were purchased by Wizards of the Coast in 1997. In 1999, Wizards of the Coast was purchased by Hasbro. And that brings us up to 2018, when Iron Studios announced that they would be releasing a series of combining diorama statues of the characters from the cartoon due out late in 2019. Dungeons & Dragons as a Saturday morning cartoon transformed the reputation of the franchise through the humor, action, visibility, and general superheroization of the concepts, the marketing blitz across all manner of merchandise, D&D was normalized. The cartoon showed that Dungeons & Dragons could be a mainstream entertainment brand the same as Marvel or Disney. Ultimately, the show was a brilliant PR move to put a new public face on the reputation of Dungeons & Dragons. The cartoon, more than anything else, is responsible for softening the image of D&D for fun and profit, for introducing a lot of the language of the game into common household use. It is no longer a thing whispered about in the same context as suicides and satanic rituals. It was the show on Saturday mornings, right after Pac-Man and before Pole Position. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Don't forget to hit the notifications bell to make sure that you are alerted every time we post a new video. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below who you would love to have seen make Dungeons & Dragons cartoon toys back in the day. Not now, back in the day. Bonus points if you don't say LJN. Who would you like?